Welcome to St. Mary's Church, the parish church of Eversley, which has stood here for over 10 centuries in some form. As you look at it today, you will see that clearly it has changed a lot, but it's still a very modest little church built of red brick, clearly at home in its surroundings and has gone through a great deal of very quiet, sometimes tumultuous history. So let's begin our virtual tour of St Mary's at the porch where we go in, but above the date 1724 seems to tell us that something happened then. And if we look at the first two sets of windows <coughs> to our right, those two are of an 18th century design. But as we begin to walk through the porch, there on the floor is a very, very large slab of stone. This is a medieval tombstone and its size tells us that the person who was originally buried under it in the church was extremely important. So we've moved back from the 18th century to something much older. Now we'll go in and discover more. As we come in through the door, we automatically turn to the east end to the altar end of the church and see an astounding sight, something you would not expect to find in this church. But this isn't medieval. If we look on the wall which is just to the right of the screen, there is a beautifully decorated manuscript um, descent of the manor which gives us the date of 1336. So we're now moving back to our medieval church. Then on another pillar, we find the grant of Eversley by King Edward the Confessor in 1042 eight years before he dies, in which he gives the village and the church in Eversley to the monks of what would become Westminster Abbey. So here we have a late Saxon church. Now Saxon churches um, were small and built of wood and wattle and daub or something very perishable. Very few Saxon churches have survived so we cannot know where our church originally was, how big it was or how it was built. But then in 1940 when a new heating system was being installed this, our sarsen stone, was rediscovered. This is an ice-worn, ice-age, huge boulder, which, like many more, were deposited by the last age all over the heathlands of Hampshire. 
It's called sarsen because in its time it was thought of as being like Saracens, that is strange, not of this country. But this has been dated to 50,000 years ago. And from this we may get an idea of the size of our little Saxon church. Whether or not this stone was used then we cannot know. But from the stone to the first archway to our east now and back in a rectangle might be the dimensions of our original little church. When we get to the 1300s, we have documentary evidence for the naming, the dedication of this church which is to Blessed Mary, the Virgin of Eversley. And if we walk into the chapel, in the right-hand corner, we will find archaeological evidence which confirms that there was a medieval church here and that its dimensions were roughly from the stone to the dimensions of the chapel. The chapel was added on to a new building over the Saxon one. This little hole in the wall is called a piscina from the Latin for a basin and in this was a basin and the communion vessels were washed there after the celebration of Mass. The reason that we know that this little object marks the external wall of the medieval church is that as with the water of baptism, the water which washes communion vessels must return directly to the earth. So this would have given to the outside of the church. So we come now to the font, the point at which the Christian life begins with the water of baptism. This is a Victorian font, but we do know that there were fonts before from records and from a remark of Fanny Kingsley much later on. For about two centuries, Eversley's little church stayed much the same. And then, at the beginning of the 1500s, a fairly dramatic addition was made. This is a 15, early 1500s arch and beyond it a very typical three-light Tudor window. The arch and the three light window were part of a chapel which was added on the south side of the church. This was undoubtedly a chantry chapel, meaning that prayers were said continually in it for the souls of departed benefactors. And the reason we know this is that in the floor of the chapel is a most unusual and very large brass monument. This was to Richard Pendleton, who was not only an employee, but probably the cleric at Bramshill House. He, we know he was 
um, a clergyman because his stone with this very unusual brass inlay is laid with his feet towards the altar. Only ordained priests may be laid like this in front of the altar. Then in the intervening 200 years, since we've now got to 1500 and we know we've got to get to 1700, what happened to the church then? We believe that very soon after its construction, the Chantry Chapel became the chancel of the church because a nave was added on to it, leaving the small chapel to the north of us as the chapel and the aisle, which then became what had been the Saxon and medieval church. And then, suddenly, the whole dimensions and feel of the church change dramatically. This is now the 18th century, the age of reason, when the church is filled with light and this beautifully modulated design of the arches and the pillars creates something far more elegant and with an air of restraint and yet control. This is the 1724 church, designed by John James, one of the foremost architects of his age, an assistant to Christopher Wren, and a builder of many elegant houses up and down the country. This is John James's memorial. You'll see from this that in the same year that he was transforming the church, he was building his own house, Warbrook. He then went back to London to continue working, but made sure that he was buried in Eversley. We don't know where, we only wish we did know. The insertion of the screen was, again, to make the sanctuary of the church, the place which holds the altar, a separate room from the rest of the church. So, in a sense, going back to the medieval idea of the very special place around the altar. The other thing that was important in John James's age was the sermon. And we don't know the date of our pulpit. It certainly was of antiquity because it was three-tiered. And we have a painting in the Kingsley collection which gives us a very good idea of what it would have looked like in the 18th century. In the next century, the man who would dominate Eversley's pulpit and grip his parishioners with the straightforward, earnest tone and message that he was giving was Charles Kingsley. So when Kingsley and his very new wife Fanny literally rushed back to Eversley because he had been here as curate for 18 months previously. This was in the year 1844 and they came to rescue the parish from physical decay and moral turptitude, as it was called then. They were also deeply concerned about the physical well-being 
of their mainly very poor parishioners. It was a huge parish that they came to. In 1842, that is when Kingsley had been there, here previously, um, the population was 740 and this was spread over 5,400 acres. There were only 162 dwellings. By 1875, when Kingsley died, the population had shrunk even more to 680. But Kingsley was intent on all th in all things to be a parish priest, to be someone whom his parishioners would relate to and he set about his wooing of them in the pulpit in this church. His children were born here in the rectory next door. Rose Georgina, Maurice, Mary St. Ledger, who was later to become the writer Lucas Mallet, and his youngest child, Grenville, who was born in 1858. In his 31 years as a parish priest here, Kingsley's achievements grew and grew, as did his fame and notoriety. He was indeed a man of many parts, and those of you who would like to know more about what he achieved in a relatively short life can go to the St Mary's website and look at A Man of Many Parts, which is a precis of everything he did by a previous rector, Graham Fuller. However, by f in the 15 years from his coming in 1844 until 1859, his fame had spread so that he was invited to preach to Queen Victoria and was appointed one of her curates. In a very short space of time, Kingsley and Fanny had done so much to change their parishioners' perceptions of what church and preaching was really about. They had established night schools for the children. Kingsley was going all over the parish giving what he called cottage lectures on hygiene and practical matters. And on Sunday, twice a day, the church was filled with between 130 and 150 of the Eversley folk who listened absolutely transfixed to his very straightforward, hard-talking style of preaching. He walked everywhere over his parish to become acquainted with the cottagers and their needs. And it was he who coined the phrase muscular Christianity. This is what he thought it should be. It should be a force for God in the present world and should look after people's well-being physically as well as their spiritual and moral welfare. I think his hymn would have been Onward Christian Soldiers which was written during his lifetime. In 1942, in the middle of the Second World War, this memorial glass was put in the Tudor window to commemorate Kingsley's first coming to the parish in 1842. The characters all relate to his writings in one way or another and also to his passions for the natural world and his relaxation of fishing. The central figure of the window, as we can see, is Saint Elizabeth of Hungary. 
Yeah. This originally was a poem begun by Kingsley as an engagement present for Fanny, begun when, at a time when in fact the possibility of their marrying did not seem very real. The legend is that she was Queen of Hungary, but her husband died and his brother became king in his place. She was much given to helping the poor, so you can see the crippled child, and she's holding a basket of roses. This was because of the brother forbade her to continue her charitable works and set a trap for her as she set out one day with provisions in her basket. His soldiers stopped her, asked her to uncover her basket and it was filled with roses. Just below her, above the name in the window, you'll see what probably looks a little bit like a sort of furry thing. In fact, it's water. And water is one of the themes always in Kingsley's life. The right-hand cherub is holding two of Kingsley's most famous works. One is his most popular book of sermons, Good News of God. The other is the only title that many people can still associate with him, which is The Water Babies, a story written for his youngest son, Grenville. The left-hand cherub, standing on the water lily, is holding a butterfly net and a fishing rod. And in the upper left-hand panels you will see butterflies. And down below, the lily of St Mary's. These are three of the items in the Charles Kingsley collection, a collection which is mainly held in the hall in St Mary's in a glass case where the objects can be seen. The first in the middle is Kingsley's fly book. This was made for him by either a daughter or his wife, most probably a daughter I would have thought, because fishing in the streams around here and further afield was not only Kingsley's passion but at regular periods in his life was absolutely essential to his health because throughout his life his temperament swung from extreme enthusiasms to the deepest of depressions and from the records held in the archive at Winchester we can see just how many times he had to be given permission from his bishop to go either to the West Country or up to the Lake District or even into Scotland to recover his balance. The object on the left is his tobacco jar, which was given by his eldest daughter, Rose Kingsley, who lived in Eversley all her life, as she put it, for the use of future rectors, not knowing, of course, that that would be very inappropriate these days. Kingsley took up smoking when he was at college in Cambridge, because he discovered that by clenching his teeth, on the stem of his pipe, he could stop his stuttering. This was a problem throughout his life, although it did improve. And interestingly, it's recorded that once in the pulpit, he never ever stammered. The object on the right is a little photograph album. 
and in that we have a picture of Mrs Kingsley with Grenville, the child for whom he wrote his strange and enduring story, The Water Babies. By the end of his life, Kingsley had tutored the Prince of Wales, held two professorships, been made Canon of Chester, and finally a Canon of Westminster, thus completing the circle for St Mary's Eversley with the original gift of Edward the Confessor to the beginnings of Westminster Abbey. Despite all his fame by the end of his life, he said even in the middle of the flurry of his popularity and arguments, he said this, I should dread being a bishop because it would take me away from home, the home to which I was ordained, where I was married and which I intend shall be my last home. For go where I will in this hard working world, I shall take care to get my sleep in Eversley Churchyard. This is Charles Kingsley's grave. Before he died, he and his wife Fanny had agreed on the design of this monument and he had made sure that he would be buried in Eversley, not in Westminster Abbey, as was intended. By then he was so famous, um, so remarkable in many ways and had been made a canon of Westminster Abbey. So naturally Westminster thought they could have him in their collection of greats. But he maintained that he was a simple parish priest, that the best work he'd ever done in his life had been here, and so he would be buried here. One of Kingsley's great contributions to Eversley Village was to ensure that it has a village school. Charles Kingsley's school was built in 1853 and Kingsley had himself chosen the young, very promising scholar in Eversley to be trained as its first teacher and headmaster. The present school, in most years, remembers Kingsley on his birthday in June by laying flowers and there's a little service at the school. The ties between St Mary's Church and Charles Kingsley's school are valued by all of us. The children this year could not put flowers on his grave but we will. Immediately following his death, there was a major commemoration of Kingsley by Sir William Henry Cope in yet another restoration of the church. And since that time, both on the anniversaries of his birth and of his death and of his coming to Eversley, there have been events which commemorated Charles Kingsley. Last year, his 200th anniversary of his birth, we had CK200, which drew speakers on Kingsley from around the world and was celebrated on the mount opposite the church. But who really 
had caused the transformation of the little church of Eversley into this flamboyant gothic image. It was in fact Sir William Henry Cope who had inherited Ramshill in 1851 so it was not he who appointed Kingsley and the fact that Sir William was also a priest, a canon of Westminster and a believer in or rather a supporter of the new high church movement in the Anglican Church which was trying to restore a sense of dignity and occasion to church worship. So very soon after his arrival he began making improvements to a little church that he regarded was very mean and poorly appointed. And so began the gradual addition of features to the church. In the second of his 1860s restoration, the screen was painted. And it was during this restoration that the lilies, which are on the rear of the screen, were designed by Charles Kingley but not painted by him as the decoration was done by a very fashionable London uh, designer. When Kingsley died, Sir William set about his third restoration. This was the grand commemoration to Kingsley. And during this, uh, several dramatic changes took place. Sir William commissioned the renowned architect W.G. Bodley to give the church further improvements. The main one of which was the raising of the height of the nave. Outside, the roof line now is so high that it obscures most of the view of John James's tower. Inside, what was added here is very restrained for Bodley and almost as if he is paying homage to John James for the barrel vault, which is a splendid feature in its own right now, echoes the shapes of the Georgian church. Down the centuries there have been some interesting connections between people, in sort anyway, which are unusual and surprising. This memorial to Mary Henrietta Kingsley, who was a niece of Charles Kingsley and an avid lady explorer into Africa at a time when such a thing was definitely not the thing for ladies to do and was generally regarded as being very dangerous. But having nursed her parents for most of her life, Mary Henrietta suddenly took herself off to South Africa and was almost one of the very first people who began to be interested in the customs and behaviours of people other than herself. Her epitaph is from the Quran and in this she links back up to Alexander Ross up in our chancel who had fled to Brams Hill from the Isle of Wight during the Civil War and who was the first translator of the Quran. So across the centuries there are these whispers of connection which please many people. 
as you'll see from this commemorative envelope, the next commemoration of Kingsley was the centenary of his death in 1975. This was organised by the then rector of Eversley, Michael Parry, who is best known for one of his carols here, which is Little Donkey, that so many people enjoy singing now at Christmas time. Michael wrote the script and produced a grand son Elumia here in the church, which was a, the story of the church in images again, as we have been trying to do for you. In the script of this Sono Lumia, he repeated something which Kingsley came to think himself, that Kingsley was descended from Archbishop Abbott, who in Eversley has got an unfortunate memory. Part of this inscription on the pillar records the more than unfortunate event when in 1621 George Abbott, who was then Archbishop of Canterbury, had come to dedicate a new chapel at Bramshill for Lord Zouche. A hunt was arranged to entertain the, the bishop and the unfortunate prelate, who perhaps had not been using his crossbow very recently, had the great misfortune to shoot and kill Peter Hawkins, the head keeper of Lord Zouche. In the registers of St Mary's, the originals of which are down in the Winchester archive, it records that we have not only the, the burial place somewhere of Lord Zouche, but also that poor Peter Hawkins is somewhere out in our graveyard. Just before we leave St Mary's, we must remember that one of the roles of the parish church has always been to have memorials to those who have fallen in, in wars. This, the image of St Mary, is a war memorial to two men who fell in the First World War. The black brass plaques so prominent on our west wall are memorials to more of those who fell in the, in the First World War. These are not men who were living in Eversley, but were living on the other side of the world, in Australia. They were the grandsons of the Tyndall, who at that point lived in Firgrove. It was not Firgrove Manor then. And so we will go out to find our war memorial in the churchyard. With one last glance to something which is rather surprising, the Royal Arms. These are usually set above the screen in a church, but St Mary's Arms of 1722 were lost in one of the renovations, restorations or otherwise works and disturbances. And again, in 1941 and then 42, Reverend Dunlop, who organised the memorial window to Kingsley, got permission to have the church be given the arms of George VI. So this again is in the Second World War and these are very, very rare arms to have to have ones which are so recent. So as we leave the church, we just glance along this 
leaf-strewn path to the little gate from the rectory garden. And you can imagine Charles Kingsley passing through this gate regularly, twice a day on a Sunday, and more often than that for baptisms and marriages. Since December 2016, Eversley's Simple War Memorial has been a listed monument in its own right. We were able to prove that the cross and the stone were both together the monument which had been designed by the people of Eversley in 1919 and executed by Augustus Gibbs, the village wheelwright and sexton, who made the original oak cross. And we now know the oak came from a pile of wood left over by Martineau from the building of Longwater Cottages. It was local oak. The stone was designed by William Letherby who became eventually Professor of Arts and Crafts in the Royal College of Arts. And his very simple design was first of all given the names of those who fell in the First World War. Subsequently, of course, the names of those in the Second World War and the Korean War have been added. And finally, the last remarkable thing in Eversley's churchyard, this enormous sequoia, or big tree. Many of you will probably know by now that this was grown from a seed found in one of Charles Kingsley's pockets by his daughter Rose, who had accompanied him on his last lecture tour to the United States when they had visited the Mariposa Grove and Kingsley had picked up one of the cones which now fall quite prolifically around the tree. Recently this tree has become a shelter in lots of ways not least in past warm weather when it sheltered the congregation of St Mary's worshipping outside in the churchyard. Our parish church holds the hopes and fears of local men and women over centuries. Their prayers of grief and of thankfulness, their celebrations of baptism and the joys of matrimony. St Mary's Eversley is a symbol of endurance and hope which continues for all into the future. We are immensely grateful to Elizabeth for sharing with us her knowledge, just a small proportion of her knowledge of the history of our wonderful church. It has been a joy to explore with her the continuity of Christian faith in this parish as we have wandered the building inside and as we have heard of the Christian faith changing and adapting through the years and the architecture and the decoration of our church so we have continued to adapt in the current circumstances in which we all practice our faith. We have, as Elizabeth just mentioned, worshipped under the tree behind me in Picnic Church, live streamed to the community in the lockdown that we have experienced in recent months. And so we pray 
but we will continue to change and adapt in response to our Christian faith in Jesus Christ in the months and the years to come. Let us pray. Lord, we give you thanks that in Jesus Christ you have an example of service to your community, to the community of people you created in your image. And we pray that we continue to respond faithfully to you, to your love for us, to your grace at work in our world as we walk with you in faith in the years to come. We pray this through the power of your Holy Spirit, in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. This short video presents the history of the Bells of St Mary's Eversley in Hampshire. The tower was rebuilt with the rest of the church between 1724 and 1735 by John James, a pupil of Sir Christopher Wren. Just before Charles Kingsley came to St Mary's as rector in 1842, two of the then three bells were replaced by one. This transaction is noted in the church warden's accounts. The new bell was cast by Thomas Mears of London in 1841. The other bell was cast by Henry Knight of Reading in 1622. The idea of adding additional bells was not a new one. In a local newspaper report on the opening of the Great Village Pageant of 1919, there appears this. The clanging of the two bells, reminder that if sufficient surplus of funds remain after the Kingsley Hall has been built, the belfry awaits a further addition of bells to make the merry chimes which festive occasions require. At the end of 1982, the rector, Michael Perry, pointed out that 1985 would be the 250th anniversary of the tower and that this might be a suitable time to restore the bells. An appeal was launched at the parish AGM in April 1983. Progress was slow until the offer of a parishioner, Jack Barker, to give two bells in memory of his mother and father provided an incentive. The donations were called in and invested and fundraising began in earnest. Grants were also given by the Sharp Trust, the Leck Trust and the Winchester and Portsmouth Diocesan Guild of Church Bell Ringers. The order for a new frame to hold six bells, two new bells and renovation of the two existing bells was placed with the Whitechapel Bell Foundry on the 19th of April 1985. May 1985 saw the beginnings of an Eversley band of ringers. Initially a dozen or so received instruction in Yately on Thursday evenings and Saturday mornings. May also saw the lowering of the two bells and their removal to Whitechapel. Two new bells, the three and five of the six, were cast at Whitechapel on the 11th of July. The two older bells, the four and the tenor of the six were fitted with new cannon retaining headstocks at the foundry. The four bells were rung for the first time on Thursday evening, 3rd of October 1985. This marked the end of what had been the original project. It was now that, most unexpectedly, two more bells were given to complete the ring of six. 
Jack Barker tragically lost his wife, Ivy. He had already given the three and the five of the six. He now gave another, the two, in memory of his late wife. Joan McNaughton gave the treble in memory of her parents and sister. She also gave the ladders as a permanent means of access to the bells. The bells and the work of restoration were dedicated to God by the Right Reverend Michael Manketalo, second bishop of Basingstoke on Sunday the 16th of February 1986. St Mary's Eversley has an active band of bell ringers and also regular visiting ringers from St Peter's Yateley. We teach bell ringing and now have a sophisticated bell ringing simulator connected to the bells. So how does bell ringing actually work? Let's take a look. There are two strokes, the hand stroke and the back stroke. The bell might be much heavier than the ringer, but because it stores energy and is balanced, it takes very little effort to pull it and make it turn through 360 degrees. The bell comes to rest using a device called a stay, which enables it to remain set for ringing. Bell ringing is a fascinating hobby, suitable for all ages, 9 to 99. If you would like to learn to ring bells at St Mary's Eversley, then please do get in touch with us, we would be delighted to teach you. You can find the contact details on the St Mary's Eversley website at www.stmarysevesley.org.uk slash teams slash bell hyphen ringers dot php and don't forget to follow us on facebook too